All right, so this is the lecture for feminist psychotherapy, the second to last lecture that we're going to have for uh, for the, uh, this class for intro to counseling. By the way, my appearance doesn't have anything to do with feminist psychotherapy. It's consistent, though. I mean, you know, it's maybe questioning some gender roles a little bit. It's just something fun for the stat students who have to watch a lot more videos than anybody any of my other classes. So, I thought maybe I'd look more interesting today for them. So we're going to talk about feminist psychotherapy. Feminist psychotherapy has a different background and a different approach in some fundamental ways from other kinds of psychotherapies. One fundamental thing that feminist psychotherapy is going to uh, include is the idea that it's the society that is sick, not the individual. And it seemed weird to me as a kid growing up in the Western US with a very individualist view of things. It seems a lot less weird to me now after studying psychology because about a century, century and a half of psychology research shows us that overall your situation changes your behavior more than your individual personality or even personal psychopathology does. Not that those can't be important, they can be hugely important, but social forces, environmental forces tend to be stronger in determining our behavior than anything going on inside of us, our personality or even our mental health symptoms, things like that. Um, so the idea that mental health symptoms could basically be caused and driven by the environment around you is not a crazy idea. But I don't think feminist psychotherapy came at it from a point of view of saying, we've looked at the evidence and this is the way it is. They came at, from, at it from the same direction that feminism did, saying, by the way, I've, I've learned just how sucky I am at doing eye makeup. Like, I need practice. This is really bad. But they came, came at it from a direction of justice, of saying, there there are classes of people in our society that are being treated unfairly and this is and this is something that needs to be addressed and so feminist psychotherapy is an outgrowth of feminism of femi of the feminist social and political movement so it that's the direction it came from not like ooh we crunched the numbers and we have a better research picture than anybody else so let's start talking about this kind of stuff uh, feminist therapy as i just mentioned it originated in the women's movement which is a few centuries old. Some people suggest a lot older than that. If you've ever seen the, the play Lysistrata, Ancient Greece, very feminist. I mean, feminism has been around for a long time. Uh, focus on equality, gender equality, and other types of equality going along with that. Because as I'll mention, feminism is not just about gender equality. It's about all kinds of equality. Anyway, um, the feminist movement evolved into various kinds of feminist orientations. Feminism is an extremely divor diverse ideological world. And feminist psychotherapy, as, an, as like the therapy expression of feminism, is extremely diverse as well. So, um, oops, I just did the wrong thing. we've been going for a little while please tell me we have is there some way to find out yeah okay all right I need to be on this screen right here this is the screen okay you can't see that but I had to change what I was looking at or else none of this makes any real sense and I think I just changed some stuff here that I did not intend to change let me just put it back the way it was okay it's complicated what am I some audio-visual Genius? No, I'm not. All right, so it involved into various feminist orientations, and I'll mention a few of them as we go along. Uh, an important person, now you should look at the presentation made by one of the teams. I wish I could remember exactly which one it was. I just looked at it yesterday. It looks reasonable. It's brief, good. Um, that talks about feminism. It's going to make some of the points I'm making here, and it has some other names that you should pay attention to, possibly for an exam. But the big name I'm going to mention is Anna Freud. Sigmund Freud... Uh, died ultimately of throat cancer because he couldn't stop smoking like dozens of cigars a day. He had multiple operations. It finally killed him. His daughter, Anna Freud, stayed with him. And I don't think she ever married or had a long-term partner that lived with her. I could be wrong about that. I don't think so, though. And one of the things that she did, I mean, she dedicated herself to her father, but not uncritically. One of the things she did was viciously criticize her father's um, theories psychoanalysis had no place for women like it says that it's this entire crisis of becoming a human being that you go through when you're in childhood is the Oedipal complex which doesn't work if you're female I mean it's like Freud is going and so all humans they discover that they don't that they have a penis 
and then that their father is scary and they want to fuck their mother but their father will kill them so they decide to be like their father and then they can fuck someone like their mother and that is how all humans develop and all the women are going like all humans all all humans um unafraid tackled that a little bit and she pressured her father to make psychoanalysis more gender equal okay you, you probably already know how i feel about psychoanalysis but uh, one of its flaws was that it was pretty sexist it was very androcentric and uh so anna freud uh, pressured her father to do things like develop the electra complex as a um as an alternative to the oedipal complex and uh is there vagina envy as an alternative to penis envy anyway there's a bunch of concepts that we have because Anna Freud like stuck her father's feet to the fire and made him think about the fact that half of the world is female not just men like he wrote about uh, so she's an important figure in the history of both feminism but especially and, and especially uh, feminist psychotherapy so she's not really a founder there wasn't really one founder this is a movement that it kind of evolved and there were people before Anna Freud applying psychotherapy with a feminist orientation and a lot of people since her so feminist psychotherapy, like so many others, is a reaction to traditional treatment, but more than just a reaction to some of the other stuff that we thought that we saw with, um, you know, existential therapy and Carl Rogers therapy and things like this. Uh, feminist psychotherapy is a strong reaction to the androcentricity and ethnocentricity in implicit in the dominant schools of thought that were out there, especially psychoanalysis. Androcentric means kind of focused on men, centered on men. So it's one way of being quote unquote sexist. Sexist is a term that can be defined a lot of different ways. It's a very general term. Androcentric is one kind of sexist. It means you're just kind of um, building everything from a point of view of thinking about men. Uh, men as being the beginning of everything and women are like kind of an afterthought. So that was Freud's therapy. It was all based on male development and male psychology. Well, his version of that. And it kind of left women out. And when he was told that he should put some women in, he's like, oh, yeah, sure. Also women are blah, blah, blah. Well, it didn't really change it much. It was still very androcentric and ethnocentric. I mean, so much of what we do is focused on dominant North American and Northwest and Western European um, cultural and ethnic patterns and the more we look into anything from other cultures around the world and other ethnic groups even within our own nations the more we find out that our research doesn't work the same way sometimes it doesn't work at all but never really works quite the same way when you translate to different cultures we've learned quite a lot about psychology by looking at other cultures we went through this period mid 20th century late 20th century we were kind of feeling like wow we're really figuring stuff out and then a lot of people were going, um, hello, hello, there's, there's other cultures. And then we look into the other cultures. I mean, it was always happening, but it started to happen quite a lot more in the 60s and 70s and kind of exploded in the 90s. Still not happening enough. And we find out that a lot of our theories don't work very well in other cultures, which means they're not really theories of human psychology, are there? They're theories of North American psychology. Some things do work and some things don't. So we're, so figuring that stuff out is a pretty long-term project. So here's a phrase that gets thrown around in feminist circles a lot and feminist psychotherapy absolutely adopts this. The personal is political. I might have mentioned that before, but you should think about this. The personal is political. What does that mean? So when somebody says, you know, I, I don't want to be political, so let's not discuss race. How does a black person feel about that? When somebody says, well, that's just uh, that's just about like prisoners and prison rights are a political thing. So let's not get political. How does a person feel like that if they were in prison or if they have a family member in prison or if a person says, well, you know, that's about taxes. That's political. Let's not discuss politics at the dinner state table because that's just taxes. Well, what if there's a person who is living on like public assistance or gets SNAP benefits or a person whose child goes to public school? Well, I want taxes to get paid and I want more of them to go to education. Absolutely. And I want some of them to go to fix my roads and stuff. So these are like my road in my in, in front of my house, my school that my child goes to, her teachers get paid, you know. That's political, but it's also very personal for me. So that and that's, you know, my uh my application of this, but the application that was much more common was in this in the 60s especially in 70s I think this phrase came from the 70s I should remember who said that 
um, you had people claiming that women's rights were like a political issue, and they absolutely are, but they're also very much a personal issue, and rape and sexual assault and our social response to it were one of the big issues that gave rise to the feminist, the modern feminist movement, let's say modern, say, since the 1960s. The feminist movement, like I said, is very old, and these issues have been around, but they came front and center in the 1960s, and they still are, as, as we look at right now with things like the hashtag and movement Me Too, with uh, Brett Kavanaugh being um, evaluated to be a Supreme Court justice, with Joe Biden, who at the time of this recording is running for president and has some plausible accusations of sexual assault against him. I mean, the, these are both political and personal. You can say that's just politics, but go ahead and ask the victims. Ask, ask rape victims and assault victims how political this is, how, how they feel about it being brushed aside because it's just politics. Uh, and this is, this is feminism. Feminism is saying politics is just life, you know, maybe on a grander scale with a lot of people aggregated together, but it's life. So the per what happens to you personally is political. Everything that's personal in your life is also political. So some of the common themes in feminist psychotherapy, um, promoting social change, that phrase, the personal is political. So like breaking down artificial lines between political stuff and personal stuff. Embracing diversity of all kinds, an analysis of power and oppression, which I'll talk about briefly. Uh, collaboration in the, in the feminist relationship, which is mentioned in the other team's presentation very nicely. Self-reflection, um, looking inside yourself, introspection. And the concept that inequality is itself damaging. So the idea of separate but equal doesn't work because separate is bad. So now that phrase comes from the civil rights movement in the 1950s, but it's been applied from time to time for all sorts of things, saying, well, we just, we just need to treat men and women differently, but that doesn't mean we're treating women worse. Feminists might say, yeah, it does. Like the fact that you treat men and women differently, that is itself a bad thing. That is inherently damaging. And that's an open question. It, but, it, but it tends to be a fundamental um, assumption of the feminist movement. So let's talk about what oppression means. This is a word that I grew up thinking was a silly word that weird people used, and it was an exaggeration. Like, no, oppression, there's no such thing as oppression unless you've literally got chains on you or the Khmer Rouge just killed your family or something. Applying it to something like feminism, that's silly. I grew up and changed my mind about that very much. Um, especially just looking at how much has been written about this for the past 40, 50, 60 years. So oppression, uh, I looked up some definitions of this, and here's one from uh, Linda Napakowski, Joan Johnson Lewis. I don't actually know who those people are be beyond this and to know that they have written some very well-received feminist books. But I looked at lots of definitions of oppression, and their definitions seem to capture all the elements that most people would agree on. Um, oppression is a type of injustice. It's, a, it's an injustice in which... Uh, authority or law, some kind of power differential that one person or group of people has relative to another group is used unfairly to prevent equality or freedom and results in systematic marginalization and reduction of rights. There's a lot of things in there. So not everything that feels bad is oppression. Not all injustices are oppression. And you can, can't just flip something around and say, well, isn't it really the case that men are the ones who are oppressed by women accusing us? No, not unless you can show that women have more authority, law, or physical power, and that they're preventing your freedom and systematically marginalizing men and reducing their rights. I mean, it's pretty hard to find any evidence that would really support this. I'm not saying that analysis can't have any legs at all. I mean, there's nothing that says women always have less power than men in all situations, but it's a pretty hard sell. I mean, look at this definition. Try and find some data to support these kinds of things. Yeah, flipping that thing around doesn't work very well. That's why you don't usually say that men are oppressed. Well, most reasonable people don't usually say that men are oppressed. So some forms of oppression that exist are sexism, racism, ethnocentrism, classism, heterosexism, ableism, ageism. Psychologists don't use these terms very much, at least research psychologists, social psychologists, because there's a lot packed into those terms. Sexism can mean a lot of things. It can mean... I personally have gender essentialist beliefs, or it can mean I think women are inferior to men, or it can mean beyond thoughts, it can mean I refuse to hire women because of my belief that they're inferior or something like this. I yell at women in the street because I assume that they exist to satisfy my sexual needs. 
So sexism can mean thoughts, it can mean feelings, it can mean behaviors, it can mean various kinds of that. It's all kind of the same, same flavor of stuff, but psychologists usually need more specific definitions of this. Um, in feminism, they're concerned very much with the very broad conception, all kinds of this, although there's a lot of discussion of the details and how it all works and stuff. But these are all kinds of oppression. When you're making decisions based on an assumption that these types of inequality are important for certain reasons, like hiring, for how nicely you treat somebody, for whether you allow them to have basic human rights, well, then that results in oppression. And by the definition that we looked at, all of these things can result in oppression. So let's talk about one type of feminist counseling, which is called uh, liberal feminist counseling. Liberal feminist counseling is maybe a good place to start. Um, it's a bit of an older type of feminism. I mean, it dates back to the 60s and before. It views, the, so when feminism is applied to psychotherapy this way, which started to happen in about the 60s, um, it, well, at the earliest, I think, 70s, it really picked up. It, so the liberal feminist counseling views the cause of problems as traditional gender role socialization. So women being taught that you have to do certain things because you're women, men being taught that you have to do certain things just because you're men, um, everybody being taught that there are only two genders, etc. And that gender determines the behavior that you have or that you must have or something like that. And so the interventions are to change your gender role socialization, to work on individual level gender role assumptions get people to challenge their gender roles in various ways and also to get people to work for social change and this is a big change from other kinds of psychotherapy feminist psychotherapy you're very likely to be invited or even challenged to get out there and do something to change your world like you're being you're being made sick here and mentally unhealthy by the fact that you have inequality in your world so go to a protest you know your therapist might actually go with you Feminist psychotherapy is a very different kind of thing. So radical feminism, this is a little more, I think this is probably more common, rough guess, among feminist psychotherapists, people who would say that they are primarily fun, feminist psychotherapists. Radical feminism is a very popular version of feminism, and so I think it's, it's widely represented. The cause of problems is oppression. And that oppression doesn't come as much from one-on-one -on -one situations, although it's definitely presented there as well. But the ultimate cause is social structures that are um, sexist, that are oppressive in and of themselves. So if you have a social structure where your culture still says that women need to be demure and sexually pure and stay home and the best thing a woman can do is be a mom, etc., and men need to be strong and bold and confident and sexually ready at all times and men can get away with certain things that women can't, women can get away with a few, a few things men can't, this is an oppressive social structure, and it gets built into laws, it gets built into religions, it gets built into like, social groups. So radical feminist counseling is going to assume, like radical feminism, that this is the source of a lot of the problems that, have, that happen in the world. So when a person comes to you and says, I'm feeling depressed, then a radical feminist might say, all right, let's look at your, let's look at your social structures. Let's look at your community at your legal system, at how your family handles problems, things like this. They're going to say, let's look at, let's expand beyond you and look at the society around you, at, at what you're embedded in, and see what's going on with that. So the interventions are primarily social change. You saw with liberal feminal, feminist counseling, the interventions were internalized change, changing the person's ideas first and then social change. But radical feminist counseling tends to go more for the social change, saying, okay, your social structures are making you sick. So what we're going to work on here is getting you elected to the t city council <laughs> or something like that, going to protests, um, learning how to write letters to your senators. So ultimately, social change must result in eliminating all forms of societal oppression. Now, I don't know if that's totally possible, and many feminists might say it's not possible, but that's intersectionality. But working toward it is absolutely what we should be doing, even if it's not possible to totally arrive there. Uh, then there's th third wave feminism. I'm going to start to break down here in my knowledge of feminism because it's not really my area. Um, I've tried to learn a lot about it in the past 10, 15 years, but it's not something I grew up knowing anything about. It was kind of a swear word in my family uh, and, you know, community. So I've tried to learn things about it, but I wasn't involved in the history of this very much. So it's learning from books like many of you are doing right now. So third wave fem feminism has a much broader focus than radical feminism and is explicitly multicultural. Third wave feminism says all forms of inequality are damaging on all dimensions. And 
it, ex it explicitly includes queer um, LGBTQ identities and lifestyles, but it includes other things as well, socioeconomic status, um, disability status, ageism, things like that. Then there's uh, another variant on this that's called cultural feminist counseling. And it says that the cause of problems is societal devaluation of women and women's roles and strengths and values and perspectives. And so the interventions for trying to fix these problems are honoring those strengths, values, and perspectives. Now, this is often expanded to not just the, di the dimension of um, gender stereotypes and gender prejudice, but other dimensions like uh, other variables like disability status, like ageism, like socioeconomic status, like sexual orientation, and identity, and things like this. Um, and so the cultural feminist counseling tends to emphasize connected empath empathic treatment relationships above all. Now, all kinds of feminist counseling are going to. They're going to have em client empathy and connection between the therapist and client, kind of like Carl Rogers, but even more. That connection is critical. The relationship itself is one of the most critical aspects. Um, other third wave feminist approaches uh, include things called women of color feminism, lesbian feminism. There are hundreds of different individual types of feminism. Some of the stuff I mentioned here is some of the larger groupings. Feminism is explicitly diverse, and so it's very open to diversity of ideology and interpretation as well. So empowerment feminist therapy is a term that, although I've already heard people saying this doesn't incorporate everything, um, it's a term that was developed in the past uh, decade or two, I think in the past couple of decades, to integrate all major feminist approaches and try and incor incorporate all of their elements at once. But like I said, there are already people in uh, uh, thinkers in the feminist sphere suggesting that this, that the way this is defined, it doesn't incorporate everything and it's still missing some stuff. So those are problems as well. So notable elements of feminist, um, well, empowerment feminist therapy probably. Therapy is about societal change. You cannot be fully sane in an insane society. You can't be fully mentally healthy in a society that seems constructed to reduce your mental health in a society that oppresses certain people. Equality in society um, is related to equality in therapy. And so feminist therapists, more than any other general school of therapy that I've ever heard of or know of, tend to be very concerned about equality in session, equality with their clients. I have talked to feminist therapists and seen you know, documentaries and stories about feminist therapists who refuse to dress quote unquote professionally because they don't want to distance themselves or make themselves look like they're in a higher position than their clients. They don't want to emphasize any power dynamics. There are, there are feminist therapists who regularly do things like go to their clients' houses and help them clean their house and take care of their kids or show up to a client's place of work and have lunch with them, like breaking down the power differentials. These things that in other kinds of therapy, other therapy backgrounds, the therapists would say, oh my gosh, that's violating boundaries. That's a dual relationship. You can't do that. Feminist psychotherapy is much less concerned about dual relationships and much more concerned about trying not to have any inequality in this relationship. Because if you think about it this way, it might help. Feminist psychotherapy is going to say and pretty plausibly, a lot of problems are caused by inequality, by power dynamics and inequitable use of power in our world, in your world, client. So in your family, in your community, in your town, in your school, in your job, workplace. And so I'm telling you that that's the source of your problem. So why then would I like mirror those problems? Why would I then become this authority figure who could be seen as abusing that same power, like that same kind of power? I mean, if somebody comes to you for help, you have power because they came to you for help. You're in a position with some sort of power and authority. Maybe not a lot, maybe a lot, depending on the situation. Well, feminist therapists are very keenly aware of that. Of that. All situations are analyzed for power, um, for power relationships, and who has more power and less power in various areas. And so feminist psychotherapists try and reduce that. Yes, they have some sort of expertise, they have some experience, but that's the only thing that they're bringing to the table. Everything else, they try to make the client empowered. The client, um, they want to bring the client into an equal relationship with them as much as possible. It's not possibly fully equal, but you can definitely reduce the power differential quite a lot. Um, so eclecticism is the, the norm here. There aren't a lot of, kind of like existential psychotherapy, there aren't a lot of uh, specific techniques that you have to use with feminist psychotherapy 
you'll find books that say, you know, techniques for feminist psychotherapy, but a lot of them are bar just borrowing techniques from other psychotherapy or from um, social change and social justice change kind of traditions outside psychotherapy. You just use what you got to use. The main thing is the goal of reducing oppression, increasing equality. So that is all that I have as far as this. Um, sorry, I'm trying to do some. Okay, that's all that I have as far as this lecture. It's a fairly brief lecture, but one of the things I want to mention is that feminist psychotherapy is just a different approach to psychotherapy from, I think, anything really that was seen before it. And it was a very needed approach. We got very sucked into this idea of individualism and one white guy who comes up with a therapy that fixes everybody. And Freud was especially a problem. Freud's therapy is authoritarian, which is weird because he didn't, he spoke about not liking authoritarianism. He spoke strongly against like the Nazis and stuff like this. He was oppo opposed to authoritarianism in general, but his therapy is explicitly and problematically authoritarian. You cannot know your own unconscious. And so when you go to therapy, someone else has to interpret who you are because your unconscious is who you truly are. Well, your unconscious plus your ego, right? But your ego arises because of the unconscious crashing into reality. And then the ego is your unconscious um, and it's something that arises to try and negotiate between your unconscious and reality. It takes its energy from the unconscious, the whole thing. So you can't be... Um, in an equal relationship with a Freudian psychotherapist or even anything close to it because the truly traditional Freudian psychoanalyst is the only person who can understand who you truly are and who you truly are is horrible and at, at, during the beginning like mid 20 early mid 20th century up through like at least the 50s 60s most psychoanalysts were male and so an awful lot of the people going to therapy were female and sometimes they were pressured into going to therapy by family members, husbands, you know, doctors who were male. So you have all these males in our world telling all these females, you're crazy, you need to go get some therapy. And then when they go to therapy, there's another male who tells them exactly how they're crazy and tells them that they can't know. I'm sorry, you're, you can't know what's actually going on with you. Let me tell you who you are and then I can tell you all your problems. And if I decide you need to be locked up, you need to be locked up. If I decide you need a hysterectomy, well then you're going under the knife. And this was the reality for women for a long time. It's not totally over either. I mean, it's, I'm not saying those problems are gone, but they are reduced partly because of feminism. Well, largely because of feminism. And feminism psychotherapy, feminist psychotherapy is a response to that. It's saying, you know, screw that. No more power relationships like this. Let's have a, th a psychotherapy that tries to get rid of those power relationships, that tries to minimize them as much as possible. And so feminist psychotherapy there's not a lot of specific instructions on how to be a feminist psychotherapist. I mean, there are lots of people who will tell you how they do it and their suggestions, but it's not like there's the Institute of Feminist Psychotherapy that everybody recognizes is the place that gives all the feminist psychotherapy rules. That doesn't exist. It's very much like a mob collective with lots of people with lots of ideas, and a lot of the ideas are in common. Everybody's going to agree oppression is a problem. Everybody's going to agree equality is better than inequality. But then beyond that, You'll find some other commonalities, I think. You'll find CBT-like, well, you'll find a lot of people who are kind of Freudian, and I think that's left over from, how, from the influence that Anna Freud had on the field. But you'll find a CBT-like emphasis or an Adlerian-like emphasis on collaboration between the therapist and the client. And you'll find therapists essentially saying, I can't know your world, show me your world. You, you show me, you're the expert, you show me your existence, you show me your world. I can't know that world. Um, and you'll get a lot of people saying, uh, I am sympathetic to what's going on with you, but because of that, you need to go change something. Like, I'm not going to be okay with you just sitting here and working on your problems only with yourself. You need to be part of change for the world. And you need to help all the other people who are experiencing inequality. You're also going to find in pretty much every kind of psychotherapy, uh, feminist, feminism and feminist psychotherapy that I personally know of, you'll find... Uh, a refusal to restrict the inequality and oppression concerns to just gender inequality. In other words, that was too many double, triple negatives. All types of feminist psychotherapy and feminism that I know of currently um, insist that equality is important for everybody on multiple dimensions. Now, the current, current past 20, 30 years, whatever, current trend in, um, in feminism and in feminist psychotherapy is intersectionality, which is an 
my limited understanding is it's an ongoing analysis of how many different types of equality inequality dimensions come together so gender is a problem but oppression also happens based on race and disability so what do you do if you have a white woman who's disabled is she oppressed what do you do if you have uh, a black woman who's a CEO or a black man compared to a black woman is one of them more oppressed than the other and so discussing these things hashing out these concerns is the focus of the overall trend in the field of psycho of feminism towards intersectionality trying to work out all this stuff and this is not just feminism this is also multiculturalism and I mean multiculturalism is intersectionality in a lot of ways so I'm gonna wrap this up now I think you have what you need for the exam that's gonna come up to make sure and take a look at the presentation that will be available to you that uh, the students prepared and the questions that they prepared for if you want to do the optional final exam but some of the content could show up on the regular exam the last exam as well and get a good look at this weird makeup because I'm never wearing this again I mean I would like to but all this effort and I suck at this how do you do eye makeup every day I'm just really bad at this I, I even shaved I never shaved you can't be a lazy person and have this kind of a look and I am a lazy person